The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the brave new world of epigenetics. We are, in effect, a programmable computer. How to change your destiny by changing your DNA. And this is a whole fascinating new uh, technology. And breaking the generational curse along the way. If you know you have it, then you'll avoid the consequences. Plus, a promise of parenthood. I remember him clearly answering me, saying, it's not that I don't have children for you. Years in the making. I realized that I had to let go of that yearning to birth my own children so that he could give me that gift of motherhood. On today's 700 Club. Well, folks, we've got a lot of good things for you today. The grand illumination at Founders Inn was gorgeous uh, yesterday, just gorgeous. And you'll see how the lighting of the lights. It was a great time. And hundreds and hundreds of little children over there. I mean, it really, maybe in the thousands. It, it, was, it was so wonderful. Kids had such a great time. You had yeah. so many fun things for them to do over there. And oh, of course, it was, it was magnificent. When those lights come on, it's magic. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's magic there. And, uh, also in the news, we've got a word about that caravan and tear gas at the border and all the mess that's going on. And we don't fully understand it. We'll talk more about that. And I'm also in the news, uh, the same investigator that got Ehud Omer, and actually he went to prison, is trying to get uh, Bibi Netanyahu convicted and they want to bring charges against him. And I just wonder, you remember that mythical figure who always ate his own children? I mean, you just think, uh, would you stop destroying yourself? You need every bit of strength you've got against the enemies. And do not do it yourself. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that, too. Uh, but I guess leading the news, some of the migrants greeting our Border Patrol agents by throwing rocks at them. That led to a melee when U.S. agents fired back with tear gas as more protesters tried to enter into our country illegally. Well, in response, President Trump has threatened a government shutdown if he doesn't get funding for border security. Amber Strong has the story. Tensions boiled over at the U.S.-Mexico border Sunday. <laughs> with Border Patrol firing tear gas into a group of nearly 500 protesters attempting to force their way through the fencing and into the U.S. This after some migrant groups push past Mexican police blockades, making their way through the Tijuana River and towards the border. Caught in the crossfire, women and children. Many young children fainted. My daughter also got gassed, one woman told reporters. It's a situation weeks in the making as thousands of migrants traveling north from Central America finally reach the U.S. border, settling in Tijuana. The U.S. closing the port of entry there in both directions for a time Sunday as they process thousands of asylum claims from migrants. The president saying he could shut down the border completely. We will close entry into the country for a period of time until we can get it under control. The, the whole border. Trump also signaling his willingness to allow for a partial government shutdown until Congress gives up the money needed for the border wall, something GOP senators want to avoid. I do not want to see the government shut down again. If we can avoid that situation, we absolutely need to do that. And I know that Leader McConnell is working very hard to make sure we get funding. Some Democrats say they've tried unsuccessfully to talk with the president already, but they're still willing to negotiate. I was in that group, a small group of us that were working to find a way out with border money, as well as making sure that we protected the dreamers, something the vast majority of Americans supported. So of course we're willing to talk about this. Meanwhile, the mayor of Tijuana requesting aid from the UN to help deal with the nearly 5,000 migrants gathered in his city, calling it a humanitarian crisis. Amber Strong, CBN News, Washington. You know, if you're like me, I don't understand it. I don't understand. I, I've been many, many times in Latin America, Guatemala, and these other countries. Uh, we have tremendous ministry down there. And I don't understand what's going on. Uh, suddenly, all these people think they can crowd into the United States. 
There's no country on earth that could just open its borders to a flood of unemployed people. You can't do it. You can't afford it. You just can't do it. But they're just thrusting themselves, and many are bringing children because they've been told if you have children, you can get in. I mean, it's a humanitarian crisis, but it's not of our making. And yet we're going to be blamed for being harsh uh, with these people when they try to storm the border. We can't allow it to happen, but at the same time, we want to reach out to these people to help them. <clears throat> and uh, I, I don't know the answer, but the main answer is we've got to get political will in the Congress to pass the necessary immigration laws. I think uh, the Obama administration was complicit in letting these people think that we were going to open our borders and they could come in any time they wanted to. I think the o Obama sent that message to them, and the message is, is resonating and is hurting us. But in any event, that's the crisis we're facing as we get out of Thanksgiving into Christmas. Well, many migrants have been trying to enter the country legally, but these same good people are running into roadblocks along the way. John Jessup has that. Thanks, Pat. Last week, a federal judge blocked President Trump's new immigration rules as the administration tries to control the flood of migrants on the southern border. The judge's decision stopped the president's plan to deny asylum to anyone caught trying to enter the country illegally. Chuck Holton recently visited the border crossing in El Paso, Texas, and found out why many migrants are unhappy with this new ruling. Ten years ago, a decade ago, we used to have 95 percent of Mexican nationals coming across. That number has changed. Now we're having about 85% Central Americans, about 10% Mexicans, and still 5% from other parts of the world. From San Diego, California to Brownsville, Texas, there are 48 border crossings where you can legally go from Mexico to the United States. This bridge spans the Rio Grande between the Mexican city of Juarez and El Paso, Texas. It's crossings like these that the Trump administration is trying to encourage people claiming asylum to use. But here there are more than 200 people waiting in line to claim asylum already. And the line moves so slowly most migrants will be sleeping on the sidewalk for more than a week. Many of them are Cubans fleeing communism. These Cuban women have been making their way through Central America for more than 10 months. We had a lot of problems along the way. The police in some places took our money, assaulted us, and the immigration authorities were even more corrupt. She's been sleeping on this bridge for five days already, trying to enter the U.S. the right way. The wait keeps getting longer, though, because so many people enter this sector illegally, because jumping the fence means jumping to the front of the line. This is the reason the Trump administration sent more than 7,000 troops to the border to shore up the fence between the points of entry and encourage people to come in the right way. Earlier this year, the president's zero tolerance policy on enforcing family separations caused international outrage. But here in Juarez, I found many Central American families who are being separated from their loved ones by lax enforcement of immigration law. This man left his home in Guatemala 18 days ago with his 10-year-old daughter but left the rest of his family behind. We came here so I can support my family. I brought my girl and I have two six-month-old twins at home. So the number of asylum cases waiting to be heard in the United States right now is over one million cases. That's up 30 percent just this year. And what that means is that one of these Central Americans who applies for asylum or enters the United States illegally and is given a court date may end up living in the U.S. for over three years before they ever go in front of a judge. Now, when they do, there's a good chance that their case will be rejected because more than half of them are. But even if they are rejected, many times they just melt back into the society and keep living in the U.S. illegally as long as they can. And that means their families back in Central America will be without fathers, mothers, and breadwinners, potentially for years to come. From El Paso, Texas, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Thanks, Chuck. Pat, back to you. You know, there's something about the story that troubles me, as I'm sure it troubles you. A district court a judge, somebody in the Midwest, in the, apparently the uh, Ninth Circuit or uh, maybe in Hawaii, uh, issues a ruling, and he acts as if that ruling is going to control the entire United States of America. 
There's something wrong with that. Now, under the Constitution, the Congress of the United States is perfectly uh, authorized to establish lesser courts to the Supreme Court and to uh, specify their jurisdiction. Congress can do that under the Constitution as written. And all the Congress has got to do is pass a law that say, look, a judge's rulings pertain only to the district in which he resides. He cannot issue uh, rulings that affect the whole United States of America. We didn't elect those guys. The President of the United States is the one who was elected. Congress was elected in specific districts, and altogether they make up the body, that uh, the legislature. But there's nothing in the Constitution that allows these district court judges to do what they're doing. And something has got to control it. And to, for the uh, chief judge to be criticizing the president because he talks about Obama judges and, and Reagan judges and, and, you know, Bush judges, it is true that the ones who are appointed by Obama have a different view of the Constitution than the ones appointed by President Trump. But nevertheless, we've got to control it. Congress could pass, while they're in session right now, could pass the necessary legislation to specify the jurisdiction of federal district court judges. And it must be done because this is a confused mess. When one judge can issue a sweeping uh, injunction dealing with the whole United States of America, it can't, it, they are not elected to do that. They're appointed for a different matter. Okay. Well, in case you were listening to this program along the way, we've got a guy named Joe Vistardi, who's a tremendous forecaster. And he told us that although there will be some real cold times during that uh, uh, Macy's Day Parade, probably the coldest in history, a massive storm was coming. And Joe, God bless him, was right on target. John. That's right, Pat, and that massive winter storm is hitting the Midwest. It caused hundreds of flight cancellations, mainly at Kansas City and Chicago airports, spawning big issues as travelers tried to return home after Thanksgiving. The frustrating thing is really because you cannot actually do anything about it. You're just stuck in here. Everybody's in the same boat. You really just you, you cannot do anything about it. Now, forecasters predict more than a foot of snow is likely in southeast Nebraska, northeast Kansas, northwest Missouri, and southwest Iowa. Downed tree limbs and power lines are also causing power outages. Well, for many families, there's a holiday tradition that happens right on our CBN campus the Sunday after Thanksgiving. It's the annual grand illumination at the Founders Inn. Here's a look at some of this year's highlights. It's the most wonderful time of the year at the Founders Inn Grand Illumination. It's been one of Virginia Beach's favorite traditions for over 20 years. Well, we come every year because it's a great way to start off the Christmas season. It was a continuous parade of holiday excitement with jugglers, marionette shows, the puppet caravan, and stilt walkers while local youth choirs filled the air with traditional Christmas carols. I wanted to see the smiles on my uh, family's face, the kids, and have them laugh and have a good time. I had a lot of fun. Kids also enjoyed Irish dancing, face painting, and visiting with Santa. They spared no expense of decorating the place and have, you know, bringing that holiday feel to it. I'm having lots of fun. I went to go get face painting and they gave me Spider-Man. Many others took in Christmas sights on horse-drawn carriage rides around the beautiful grounds. I like seeing the horses. It's so fun. The spectacular 35-foot Christmas tree was the perfect backdrop for kids to gather around Pat Robertson as he read the Christmas story about the birth of Jesus. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then everyone waited with excitement for the grand finale. With the flip of a switch, hundreds of thousands of dazzling lights came to life. A perfect start to the holiday season.
Well, if that doesn't put you in the holiday spirit, I don't know what will. Pat? Man, we had it. It was more fun. The place was jammed with little children. Really was. I haven't seen that many painted faces in one place <laughs> in a long time. Well, the one thing is that when you throw that switch, I'm, I'm up on the balcony and the, the, the garden is out there and it was just jammed with people. And I had, you know, you helped me do it and we can't 10, 9, 8, mm -hmm. and count it down to zero and then pull the switch and those lights all went on and it was just beautiful. It really was. It's, it's magical and it does sort of set the tone for the rest of, well, of the season. Gordon has got something coming that he um, is called a Christmas village and he, he learned about it when he was over in Germany. So we've got a number of vendors, I mean a whole lot of them as a matter of fact, that will be in the uh, mall <clears throat> and there will be a huge Christmas tree and all kinds of music and everything going on. And that's opening... Uh, December the 6th, I believe. December the 6th. All right. Well, it's, they're all setting up for it right now. It's going to be gorgeous. <laughs> a Christmas Village uh, at Regent CBN Campus. I'm sure you can go to CBN.com and find out the details. CBN.com. Get the details. All right. Terry's nice. Well, up next, we're going to go in-depth on a medical breakthrough. Hear how you can literally rewrite your DNA and change your family's destiny. If you make a healthy change, it'll be transmitted through your generations. If you make an unhealthy change, it will also influence subsequent generations. I mean, this is a whole fascinating new uh, technology. CBN News takes you inside the science of epigenetics and reveals how it can shape the future of you and your loved ones. You're watching the 700 Club. It's getting closer and closer to Christmas. We've just had a nice Thanksgiving weekend. And uh, I want to tell you, years ago when I was in college, we studied uh, about a Russian fellow named Mendel. And uh, the Mendelian law was pretty much fixed. And the idea was that if you had a certain genetic uh, structure, that that was fixed all your life. So you, you, you had those genes, and that's what you had, and that was the way it was. Now, scientists have come up with something that they call not genetics, but epigenetics. And it's an exciting new field. It's cutting-edge medicine. It's a field that science have only been studying for the last five or ten years. And one of their key discoveries is that you and I can turn certain genes on and we can turn certain genes off. And what's more, these changes can actually be passed down, just like the Bible says, through generations, which is something mentioned in the Bible. Here's Laurie Johnson with the story of epigenetics. Like millions of Americans, Ashley Skidmore joined the trend of taking at-home DNA tests. All of my friends were doing just the ancestry test, and I just decided on a whim to throw in the health section. The results indicated Ashley inherited a gene that often leads to lung disease. I took the results to my doctor, and my doctor was very alarmed by the results, and I had no idea what it even was. The good news, thanks to the new science of epigenetics, there's hope for Ashley and others. DNA is not our destiny, because even if we inherited some genes we'd rather not have, epigenetics tells us we can turn them off. In his book, Change Your Genes, Change Your Life, Dr. Kenneth Pelletier says we control our genes, not the other way around. Uh, how we live our lives and how we influence the expression of our genes. That's what's critical. So it gives us the responsibility and gives us the, the power to influence our life direction. He says bad genes are activated by bad behavior. In Ashley's case, smoking turns on her problem gene. That's what makes the gene express itself. But if you know you have it, then you can not smoke and you'll avoid the consequences. It gives me hope that I can silence it. But if I were a smoker, it's basically um, my life expectancy is 50 years old. Epi means on top of. Our epigenome is like flexible software on top of our genome, which is like fixed hardware. Our behavior controls the epigenome, which in turn controls the genes. We are, in effect, a programmable computer. That's how we were made. 
Equally fascinating, researcher Dr. Randy Jertle proved epigenetic changes don't just stop with us. For better or worse, these gene manipulators can actually be passed down to future generations, backing up the biblical warning written thousands of years ago. You can see that, in effect, what God, I think, was telling us is that since they're not totally erased necessarily from generation to generation as they go through the egg and the sperm, can literally give rise to problems in the next generation, in the following, in the following, out the four and five generations. When Dr. Jertle fed healthy nutrients to pregnant mice, which carried a gene for obesity and jaundice, her offspring were born thin and brown. There are these transgenerational changes that take place. Dr. Pelletier believes similar scenarios play out in human beings. So the good news, if you make, if you make a healthy change, it'll be transmitted through your generations. If you make an unhealthy change, it will also influence subsequent generations. I mean, this is a whole fascinating new uh, technology. So while we can't control the genetic hand we're dealt, the new science of epigenetics tells us we can control how these genes behave in ourselves and our offspring. Well, Laurie joins us now to dig a little deeper. Joy, this is a brand new field, isn't it? It really is. It's fascinating. It's just the tip of the iceberg. And I hope our viewers take note because we're going to be hearing about epigenetics for many years to come. And you can say, I remember when Pat Robertson was talking about epigenetics way back in 2018. Well, well it's cutting edge. Well, you know, again, I said, I, I learned about the Mendelian law, mm -hmm. that you had certain genes and those genes were fixed and you go through life with those genes, period. Right. Now, I had a doctor from Cleveland Clinic come on this program. He said, now, let me tell you something. If a pregnant woman will eat broccoli three or four day, times a day, while she's pregnant, she will absolutely immunize her children against cancer. And I thought, that's kind of nice for pregnant girls to learn that. Mm -hmm. But what else have you learned about the behavior when people are pregnant? What will it do? Well, actually, during pregnancy is one of the most crucial times for epigenetic changes. Okay. So when uh, a child is in its first trimester, that's oftentimes when these genes are turned on and turned off. And so moms need to really be careful about the food that they eat, all those nutrients, but also Stress. Stress is huge. It has a huge impact on epigenetic changes and also uh, toxins, like don't breathe cigarette smoke, mm -hmm. don't smoke, whatever you do. So these things are so vital. If somebody's mean, I mean, if the mother is mean and nasty and hateful, that will stress the genes? It absolutely positively will. Not only uh, the most critical time for epigenetics is during the first trimester, mm -hmm. the second most critical time is the entire pregnancy, and then the third is right after birth. Those, those first few um, months and Thank years, you. up until age Couples. six that argue and fight and the husband is saying terrible, you are a nasty woman and so forth, and the woman's pregnant, and, and that's going to affect her genes for third and fourth generation? Without question. They've shown it in animal studies, and they've also shown it in human studies, that stress can have a terrible impact on your genes. It turns on all kinds of bad genes and turns off the good ones. So you need to try to reduce your stress. And tomorrow, we're gonna to talk about specific things that you can do to turn on your good right. genes and turn off your bad genes. But I wanted to drill down a little bit deeper on the mm -hmm. fact that you can pass these epigenetic changes yeah, to yeah. generations. I mean, they've done animal studies where they've passed down epigenetic genera um, changes for 14 generations in animals. And, uh, you know, you saw the one with uh, the agouti mice. Yeah. But they've also shown that you can have epigenetic changes like phobias and fears that are passed down to generations. They took these mice, and mice love the smell of cherries. Yeah. And so they, uh, they made these mice smell cherry blossoms, and then they electrocuted them. They would do it over and over again so that when the mice smelled the cherry blossom, they would be afraid. Of course, they were afraid of that smell. Well, then they mated those male mice and their children and grandchildren were afraid of the smell of cherry blossoms. Those 
children and grandchildren were not electrocuted. You know, they were just given the smell. Uh, uh, many people are talking about uh, curses and demonic. This isn't curse and demonic. This is this is science, isn't it? It really is. It is. Yeah. It's absolutely scientific. And then they showed also um, other things that can happen during pregnancy that are changed um, through the generations. You may remember the hearing about the Dutch famine during World War II, yeah. 1944. This was when food was cut off to the Netherlands and yeah. 20,000 people starved to death. Well, women who were pregnant during the Dutch famine, their children and grandchildren suffered the effects. But what's interesting is when you are deprived of the nutrients that you need when you're pregnant, yeah. your children are often obese and unhealthy because when you're when you don't give your children in utero the nutrients that they need there there are certain genes that affect your weight gain and insulin resistance and these genes do not do not develop properly in other words the good ones are turned off and the bad ones are turned on but that'll go second third fourth all the way down the line mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because um a, a female's eggs are yeah. formed in utero okay and so there are three generations going on when you're pregnant okay let's say um you've got you've got your daughter and then her eggs are being formed now with men with males their sperm are formed during puberty and so they've noticed that men who are males who start smoking prepubescent males who before their sperm are formed that their offspring and their grandchildren are obese and have greater weight gain which goes to show that this is passed down through the males as well this is unbelievable you you know but i don't know if people realize what their life uh, uh, choices uh, do to they're talking about their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, their great-great-grandchildren. It goes, who, how many generations do we Well, know? they've shown in animal studies 14 generations. In human studies, they've shown that Holocaust survivors, mm -hmm. so people who were really stressed, their children and grandchildren have greater anxiety disorders, and they believe that that's an epigenetic thing. Now, as far as testing human beings, there's a lot more to be done, but we can see and make and make deductions that these are epigenetic well, changes. How do they correct this? I mean, if you get, let's see, you got a kid and he's, he's all scared of things because his mother was frightened. How, how do you correct it? Well, I think the first thing is it makes us more compassionate because we've seen that people who are, like you were talking about, the way a, a child is nurtured, they've shown that mice who are nurtured right after they're born mm -hmm. are able to handle stress better later in life. And then the mice whose uh, mothers, they, they, they withheld them from their mothers, they were subjected to stress later on in life and they couldn't handle it as well. Mm -hmm. So we look at human beings and think, hey, why can they not handle so like in battle, for example, you've got two soldiers, one of them gets PTSD and the other doesn't. That could be an epigenetic explanation for that, too. Same thing with people who have difficulty losing weight. We see adults who some people lose weight easily and other people who struggle. And we are like, hey, why don't they just lose weight? Well, it's harder for some people because some of their weight loss genes are turned off. Some of their weight gain genes are turned on. But to answer your question, what do we do there? We're going to talk about that tomorrow. There are specific things that you can do for yourself and for future generations. But to think the Bible says, I will bless you to the second, third, and fourth, and thousands of generations to those that love me, mm -hmm. but I'll curse you for generation for down the road. Mm -hmm. And this is being borne out scientifically what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. We suffer the consequences of our actions and so do our offspring. Now, they do say that um, the scientists used to believe that all epigenetic changes were wiped out at conception. Uh -huh. But they found out now that really about 10 percent, so not all epigenetic changes are passed down through the generations, and they're trying to figure out which ones. Yeah. But they're saying about 10 percent. Lori, this is fabulous. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've got tomorrow, you're going to talk about some of the ways that you could beat the game. But, you know, this whole thing about generational curses, this is not a spiritual curse. This is a scientific, uh, a biological right. thing that happened. But it, it's because of behavior. Mm -hmm. If somebody is cursing, I mean, you could imagine couples fighting all the time. Mm -hmm. And their, their, their offspring have to bear the, the price of right. that. Right, right. But it is a spiritual issue because really 
I believe the best, maybe even the only way to properly deal with stress is through a relationship with Jesus Amen. and following him and all the things that he says about don't worry, forgive people, you know, bless your, uh, bless people who curse you and all these things are actually stress reducers. That's right. And so we don't have to change our circumstances. People are like, oh, if I didn't have an hour long commute every day, then I wouldn't have so much well, stress. Know, that's the it's key. not about changing your circumstances. It's about changing your heart. I teach on miracles. I've got a, a, a very important teaching on how to have miracles. And the thing that the Lord says, if you, while you're praying, if you have aught against any, forgive that your heavenly Father might forgive you. So in order to, to get the flow of spiritual power, you have to forgive. Yeah, and this whole thing with epigenetics is the same thing. If you have a, an unforgiving uh, spirit, it'll go through to your genes. And all the way. Right, and we talk so much about nutrition and the importance of a nutrition, yeah. eating broccoli and all that. But there's reason to believe that stress is even more damaging than a poor diet. And again, yeah, it's not only forgiveness, but it's not being angry, mm -hmm. uh, even at people like Donald Trump and Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> I mean, there's so much anger and, and it goes yeah. on and on and worry and trust and all these things are ways to reduce stress without having to change your life circumstances. Well, people are like, oh, if I didn't have such a bad boss, I would never say that, by the way. But people are like, oh, you. if I didn't I'm have such so a bad boss, I wouldn't be so hey. stressed out. And you don't have to be stressed out, even if you have a stressful lifestyle. I, would, I did want to mention one yeah, other ahead. thing. Um, epigenetics is different than gene editing. Gene editing is also very much in the news, especially today. There's news out of China that people took a gene out of these children and put a different gene in. And um, gene editing is very different from epigenetics, but a lot of times people get them confused. Mm -hmm. What they're doing with gene editing is they're literally taking a gene out of a person's DNA and putting a healthy one in. And then these people are going on. Does that work, by the way? It does. And there's this new machine called a CRISPR, and it's going on. But see, actually, epigenetics mm -hmm. and gene editing are sort of at odds because gene editing says, hey, you've got a problem gene. Let's take it out and replace it with a good one. Whereas with epigenetics, people are saying, you've got a problem gene. Just turn it off with lifestyle. <laughs> Right. So both of them are confusing. Both of them are brand new, okay. but they're different. <laughs> right. Have you got any, any literature on this, by the way? I do. This is the book. Uh, I just You saw the interview with Dr. Pelletier just yeah. a moment ago. Dr. Pelletier uh, wrote this excellent book, Change Your Genes, Change Your Life. Uh, he is a really smart guy. He graduated magna cum laude. Me, I graduated thank the laude That's by it. the skin <laughs> of my teeth. Laude, laude. <laughs> Nevertheless, even though this is a very complicated and he's a real smart guy, he kind of dumbs it down for regular folks to understand. So this is a great book to understand epigenetics. Well, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. This is great. Laurie, thank you so much. My pleasure. Folks, when you watch this program, you are getting, I'm talking about cutting edge. We did a whole thing about the gut floor that can change the lives of millions of people, millions. All these autoimmune diseases that are caused by the gut floor are not working. Now we're talking about something you can change your future generations, epigenetics. It's cutting edge, and you're here listening to it with our peerless <laughs> biological reporter. <laughs> Sorry, God bless By you. By the way, speaking of, I know we have, we're short on time, but you talk about the gut flora yeah. and the gut microbiome. Guess what? Mm. That influences your epigenome. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Oh, it does? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we, we're getting it all together, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> it's all interrelated. All right. Just, just before Christmas, don't eat too much. All right. Terry, what's next? Well, coming up, one couple's quest for parenthood takes them on a journey thousands of miles long. To finally see that child that that you waited for, that child that that you didn't think was going to happen, to start pouring that love into him was incredible. Hear a heartwarming story about the true meaning of family when we come back. I want to tell you, there is no way you're going to get this any. For $25, this is a bargain. It really is a bargain. This is the, the whole Christmas carol, you know.
It's tremendous. And and you're the sole player. I'm the sole player. <laughs> I've, I've got the ghost of Christmas present and past and, and future and all the rest of it. Old, old Marley and, and Scrooge and everybody. It's all there. And then we've got these Christmas traditions. How come we do what we do? Why do we have Christmas trees? Where does the rain be? Where does Santa Claus come from? All that. And you'll learn all that. It's, it, one is the DVD. The other is the CD. And uh, $25? Gracious me, that's... I'd, I'd overdo it if I were you, just to, because you realize the whole <laughs> bargain. It's show your thanks. But anyhow, CBN, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Okay, Terry's here with us. Well, Elizabeth Molina is a native Californian who's lived in Hawaii and Spain. She's racked up miles traveling to countless countries, but she's quick to say that no exotic locale could ever have prepared her for the adventure she calls motherhood. For Elizabeth Molina, nothing meant more than the thought of becoming a mother. So when she and Mario married in 2002, she was excited to give birth to children of their own. Parents, children, I wanted to be able to pour love into them, into their lives, just like my family had done for me. But the couple's attempts at pregnancy were unsuccessful, and the cause of infertility was never determined. We just couldn't figure it out. You know, we were both, uh, we had a, uh, Pretty much a perfect life, I hate to say it. You know, we both had really good jobs and we had our house and we had traveled a lot and and then we wanted this. We see all these people who may not even want children. And uh and we just couldn't have them and it was just uh, heartbreaking for us. Fertility drugs yielded no results, and in vitro fertilization just seemed too expensive and risky. Elizabeth continued to pray through her own feelings of discouragement. I would get up early in the morning and do my devotions. And I remember clearly sitting, doing my study, praying and asking God, why? Why is it that it's not happening? And I remember him clearly answering me, saying, it's not that I don't have children for you. It's that I need you to let go of that desire. I need you to really relinquish that desire to me so that I can show you what I have. I just felt like, I needed to be content knowing that he had control of the situation. And I realized that I had to let go of that yearning to birth my own children so that he could give me that gift of motherhood. Soon the couple began to look into international adoption. After a few months time, they were matched with four and a half year old Jordan. The Molinas traveled to Haiti to meet him for the first time. And I saw Jordan and I was like, you know what, that's my son. I, I don't know what it was about him, his smile, his eyes. To finally see that child that, that you waited for, that child that, that you didn't think was gonna happen, to finally get to see him, to touch him, to hold him, and to start pouring that love into him was incredible. The Molinas met Jordan's biological parents and learned that he had an infant brother who was in need of a stable home. There was only one answer for the Molinas. They would adopt baby Grant too. For two and a half years, the adoption process continued. Finally, six-year-old Jordan and three-year-old Grant could come home with their new family. But the Molinas say the moment was somewhat bittersweet. In order for us to become a family, a family was being broken apart. And so that was really hard. I wrote a letter to the birth mom. I wrote a letter to her and I told her that I know this is a very hard decision for her. And I knew that she loved her children very much and that I would do my very best, not only to provide for them material wise and education, but that I was gonna love them as if they had been birthed to me. And that I was also going to share with them about their birth family and I was going to plant in them a love for their country and a desire for their people. Today, Grant and Jordan are doing well in school. When their homework is done, they love to play sports like basketball and soccer. They also enjoy attending church. And with their mother's help, they've organized charity and mission trips to their homeland, Haiti. I always had a heart for helping out people. And uh, like when I see somebody on the street, I always pray for them when we're driving uh, for our, like, our road trip or anything. And like, 
it's just really cool to see other people that don't have it, nothing have something. I like how Papa works very hard for to uh, just give us like the things we need to survive and mom how she's makes the food on the table and I like how they're like always there for me. And the Molina family continues to grow. In 2015, they adopted two daughters, Laura and Hope. Elizabeth says she has seen her story come full circle. Once yearning for children, she let go of her own plans and let God shape her heart and her image of family. Family is, um, it starts in your heart and it grows and it becomes this uh, overwhelming sense of love that you have for other people and for their well-being. The Molinas say their unique story is a picture of God's love. When we go to places and when we walk together as a family, obviously we get a lot of stares because we all look very different. And uh, people are curious, they wanna know. But I tell them, I say, it's not a bad thing. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to share about God and His power and how He was able to bring us together. Elizabeth is passionate about ending poverty in Haiti and providing resources for people in the country to help families thrive. She is also an author who shares her adoption story in her book called Pieces of My Heart. I wrote it for my children. I wanted them to know that God built our family and He designed it so perfectly. I know that God has a plan for all of us. And if we're willing to step through the door, He is going to faithfully lead us. It's interesting, isn't it, how when there's something in our life that's painful and this couple's situation, infertility, uh, given to the Lord, He blesses that and meets the need of someone else. And that's very biblical as well. So happy, happy family, Molina family. It's wonderful to see what God's done. Well, one Sunday, a Buddhist girl named Vanita followed her Christian mother to church, and that's where she saw CBN Superbook. It's also where she gave her life to Christ. Vanita grew up in a Buddhist household in Indonesia. Her mom, Lily, was Christian, but didn't practice her faith. We lived with my mother-in-law, and I didn't want to have a conflict with her or my husband over religion. Then one day, Lily decided to go to church again. Vanita wondered where her mom was going. My parents never shared about God. The next Sunday, Vanita asked if she could go to church too. That's when she saw a Superbook for the first time. When I watched the story of Moses, I learned that God has great power. He can split the sea and help all of the suffering people to escape. At the end of the episode, Vanita's teacher told the class that Jesus had died for their sins. Vanita prayed to become a Christian that day. Before I heard about Jesus, I didn't know that He could save me, but He did. Jesus has changed me and made me a better person. Vanita then invited her older sister to church, and she became a Christian too. I now pray for my dad and my brother so they know about Jesus and can be Christians too. Thank you very much, Superbook, for teaching me about Him. Vanita's life and her eternity have been changed because of the gospel message she heard in Superbook. Superbook is changing lives all around the world. And this Christmas, give the children you love a gift that they will never forget. Superbook Club members are the first in line to receive the latest episodes. And if you join today, you'll receive three copies of the newest episode, It's Jesus Feeds the Hungry. Plus, you'll get three copies of The First Christmas. And not only that, you'll get three brand new Superbook coloring and activity books. And it's all yours for a recurring monthly gift of $25. So go to CBN.com or call us at 1-800-700-7000. Tell the person on the other line that you want to join the Superbook Club. It's well worth it. And this latest, Jesus Feeds the Hungry, it's a great message for kids. There are so many wonderful stories in Superbook. We don't want your children to miss out on any of them. Well, still ahead, it's time for your questions and some honest answers. Deborah asks, is it okay for a Christian to do yoga if it's Christian yoga? Pat weighs in on that and more, so don't go away. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Local Indian officials say they know where a young American missionary was killed by tribal people on a remote island near India. 26 year old John Allen Chow was killed by North Sentinel Islanders who apparently shot him with arrows and then buried his body on the beach. Now Indian authorities are trying to figure out how to recover his body. Chow went to the island to quote, share the love of Jesus. Police say he knew the Sentinelese were hostile to all outsiders. Well, CBN's Orphan's Promise inaugurated a new soup kitchen in Mexico. Orphan's Promise works with a local church in the city of Nicolas Romero to offer free after-school classes. For years, they could not serve a larger amount of children because they lacked a cooking facility. But now the new kitchen is ready and can triple the amount of recipients by providing hot meals to children. In addition, they also use Superbook to share the gospel with the kids. Well, to learn more about what CBN is doing around the world, go to CBN.com slash international. Pat and Terry will be back with more Today's 700 Club right after this. Well, the calendar may say that today is Cyber Monday, but here at CBN, we're still in Give Back Tuesday. It went from last Tuesday through tomorrow, actually. And it's the day the week set aside for helping others during this holiday season. In honor of Give Back Tuesday, CBN partners will match your gifts dollar for dollar through tomorrow. That means your donation goes twice as far and even more people around the world will receive food, clean water, medical care, and so much more. So please call 1-800-700-7000 or you can give by logging on to CBN.com. But you really can make a difference when you step up to the plate. So let's all do that together and see many, many lives changed. I know it's the heart of God, and we all yeah. want to pursue that. Okay, time for some questions right. with honest answers. Are you ready? It. Okay, this first one, Pat, comes from Deborah, who says, Because of back problems, my doctor wanted me to do yoga. Being a Christian, I was against doing this. A friend told me about holy yoga. <laughs> I've never heard that before. Holy yoga is yoga exercises or poses done to Christian music and scriptures and praying. I've done a few sessions and do feel better afterwards, but I can't help questioning if I should be doing this. Your thoughts? Right. Look, uh, what you're talking about is a series of stretching exercises. There's nothing wrong with stretching. The traditional yoga, you've got a Sanskrit uh, chant that you do where you're actually praying to Hindu gods. And that's what the traditional yoga is. Of course, you don't want to do that. But in terms of stretching exercises, it's some good stretching. I mean, what's wrong with stretching? I mean, this, <laughs> I mean, it's good for you, and uh, you can have other names to it. I mean, people call it Pilates and so forth. But anything that does to stretch your your body and stretch your muscles and get them going is good for you. Just don't go along with all that uh, Hindu. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Chanting or mantra, chant. I guess they yeah, call it. Okay. Right. okay, this is Morgan who says, I've been divorced for eight years. My ex-husband claimed to be a Christian when we were dating, but later rejected God after we were married. That's when he began cheating. He left me and my infant son. I am financially stable and don't need to be married. I support my son and myself, and we live comfortably. However, I have a deep heart's desire to be a wife. I feel like a piece of me is missing. I find entertainment or enjoyment and fulfillment and keeping a cozy home. I also miss companionship. God has provided in all other areas of my life, even when things didn't seem like they'd work out. Yet he seems to be silent in this area. I trust God, but why would I have such a deep heartfelt desire to be a wife and be married again, yet it's not being provided? It's not for lack of trying. I've dated, but it seems most men are only out for one thing and don't truly want a relationship at my age. I'm tired of the dating hamster wheel. Oh. I don't know what to tell you about that, except uh, you, you were, uh, your husband committed adultery. Uh, he's broken the marriage. That is a grounds for divorce. He's divorced you and left. Uh, he's, he's abandoned you. So you've got the Pauline privilege. You've got the Lord's statement. And you are free to, to marry. And I'm sure you're right. You go dating and some man, what he wants is sex. He doesn't want a long-term relationship, you need to find somebody who is more honest and honorable and wants to, uh, to get married. That's what you want to do is to get remarried. Uh, I don't know what to say except, you know, go looking. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a single study at church might be well, a safer place. Those, yeah, but I've, we've mentioned before <clears throat> that the churches are not, uh, um, you know, uh, set up as a, 
as a dating uh, service. But nevertheless, see if you, you can't find some Christian people at, at a singles group of churches, Terry points it. All right, what else you got? Okay, this is SB who says, Pat, I don't know what to do anymore. My husband has been addicted to porn all his life, but he hid it from me. We've been together for three years and all of these years, he's been watching porn behind my back and now he's going to strip clubs and bars. I don't want a divorce and I've asked God to help me. The reason why I don't want a divorce is because besides porn and lying, he's a good man and I know he's the one for me. He's just in a dark place. What should my next steps be? How can I help my husband? Well, I think you need to get confront him with somebody. If you can find a godly pastor or somebody who's a godly uh, psychologist who can give him uh, treatment. Uh, porn is a, an addiction just like alcoholism. It is a very serious addiction. You say this is a good man. You want to stay married. Well, okay. Uh, you have grounds to get out, but I, I think something's got to uh, smack him upside the head and, and bring him to his senses. But it is an addiction. You've got to deal with it like any other addiction. You may have to have uh, uh, an intervention of some kind, but it's one of those things that's deeply ingrained in his mind. And I don't know what to tell you, except he needs serious psychological help and he needs spiritual counseling. And that's what you need, period. Okay. Okay, this is Janet who says, my pastor told me that even if you get a divorce legally, in God's eyes, you'll always be married because of the covenant made before him. Is this true? This would tell me that I can never remarry. Um, it's true and it's not true at the same time. What you've got to recognize is that if you have a ground, as we mentioned before, if there's uh, adultery, uh, if there is uh, desertion, some of those things, then or what I call constructive desertion, then you're free to remarry. And uh, those bonds that you have consented to, that covenant, has been broken by your husband, and they no longer exist. So you're free to remarry. So you're not bound for the rest of your life if you've got somebody who's doing the stuff that I'm talking about. We leave you with this power minute from the book of Isaiah. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And tomorrow, you're going to rewrite your family's story. Laurie Johnson talking part two of epigenetics. You don't want to miss it. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.